I know that uh, you know those talks where there's a lot of audience participation. It's kind of awkward. You know, it's like somebody asks for, if anybody has a question or to raise their hand if something, and everybody kind of mills around. Well, guess what? This entire talk is only that. <laughs> so if nobody asks any questions, it's going to be really awkward for everybody. So let's do this. I'm going to give you a second. So I've pair programmed for 27,000 hours, which is about every working day, more or less, for 13 years. And uh, I really want you to ask me anything because people find this topic fascinating. So I'm going to give you a moment, a couple seconds, to just in silence think of one question that you might want to ask. Okay, go. Okay, that question you thought of is probably one of the top three or five questions, so throw that one out. And think of another question that you might want to ask. How do you get over being nervous? Uh, how do you get, get uh, oh, you're going for it. Awesome. How do you get over being nervous? Let's do this thing, sure. How do you get over being nervous when you're pair programming with somebody? Um, having a lot of time, doing it a lot. That makes a big difference. That first time is always, the first time you've ever paired with somebody, and even now, after 13 years, the first time I pair with somebody, I'm nervous, um, and I'll even admit that uh, you know we organize our our projects into these we call them stories. You can call them cards, whatever little features. And whenever I'm about to start a feature with somebody that may last a day or two, uh, even if I've worked with this person for a long time, I'm nervous when we click that start button because I'm always thinking like this could be the time when I completely fall apart. And it turns out that I don't know what I'm doing, and the person I'm working with is going to think I'm an idiot. Um, it, it happens like just for a few moments. It, it always happens. So I think for me, the answer is I never stop getting nervous, um, but you, it's, it, it becomes just kind of part of it, and you get over it really quickly, especially when you have a good rapport with people. Uh, there's a question in the back. No stupid questions. Yes. What is pair programming? Uh, in general. So maybe I'll force you to answer another question. I'm sorry. Raise your hand if you've ever pair programmed. Wow, that's almost everybody. I would say that was 80 to 90 percent maybe. Um, so for the 10 percent who are left, pair programming is a software development technique uh, by which two programmers, although it can be a programmer and a designer, it could be two people, we'll just say that, are working on the same computer, quote unquote computer, solving the same software problem at the same time. So sometimes that's literally two people sitting side by side at the same computer with two keyboards usually, um, trying to decide you know, how to write this line of code right here, whether or not we should go take a different direction, whether or not uh, uh, should we follow these solid principles that we just learned about, um, or how to better follow them, and kind of constantly working together to come up with the best solution to whatever, whatever problem you're solving at the moment. Um, sometimes you can do this remotely too, so it doesn't have to be at the same computer. You can do it across screen sharing and, and, and such as well. So that's kind of the canonical uh, description of what pair programming is. And there's a lot of benefits as well, but there's a question, so I'm not going to pass it up. Good for what pair programming is bad for? What is pair programming good for and what is pair programming bad for? Uh, so we tend to believe, I should say, I'm going to put my, this on me. I believe that there's almost no problems that are bad for pair programming. Um, we even pair write, this is going to sound weird, but it, it makes sense, I promise. We sometimes pair write emails. Um, especially if, for example, you are sending an email to maybe a politically sensitive uh, a manager or something like that, or you're, maybe you're working in a complex organization where you know, everything is email all the time, and you're trying to 
over you know, capture well some there. kind of situation. We'll write that together so that we come up with like something really good. Maybe that sounds kind of weird, but we'll even take it that far. Now, a question I have heard is, can you pair program on those sort of, ooh, sorry if that's flickery. Um, I just unplugged this thing. Um, let me plug this power in, but I'll answer while I'm doing that. Um, I've, haven't had, I've had people ask me, what about the kind of quote unquote artsy things or you know, algorithms and that kind of super, those, those things that traditionally are thought of as to, where you, know, where you go to a mountaintop and you think about for a long time and you come up with like Google search algorithm or something like that. Um, I think you can pair program on those as well. Um, uh, I, I really don't think that there's hardly anything you can't pair on. Right here. Can you pair program without talking to each other? So I actually know somebody who on Twitter uh, or tweeted the other day, well, remote pair, pro remote pair programming is so hard. And I wrote back and said, oh, what kind of problems are you having? Because I'm passionate about that particular topic and I like to help. And he says, well, you know, when you can't talk to each other, it's hard to know what's going on. I was like, well, it's really, really hard to pair programming without talking. Um, I can honestly say I've never pair programmed in silence. Well, like I've had like that person who won't talk. That's a different problem. We can talk about that. But as far as say, literally having no means of verbal communication, I've never done that. I don't think it would work very well. Have you done this? Uh, no, but I like the idea of like taking it in turns and having your code speak for itself. Oh, that's interesting. Having your code speak for itself. I like the philosophy of that as an experiment. I might have a hard time justifying billing my clients for that experiment. No. <laughs> uh, I saw something right here. Um, you have any tools for remote pair programming? Uh, yeah, so uh, what are the tools for remote pair programming? Um, I have a whole talk I could do just about that. So I won't go too deep into it, but in general you need uh, some kind of voice communication, Skype, Google Hangout, something like that. There's screen share, and you need some kind of screen sharing technology by which you can collaborate on the same computer to solve the same problem. Now, I am opinionated about what I'm about to say. A lot of people might not agree with me about this, but I will say it anyway. And that is, people will often say, like, I remote pair program and we use Skype or we use Google Hangouts. And I say, you're not pair programming, I'm sorry. You are certainly collaborating very, you know, intently on the same problem, but you're not pair programming because you can't both program. That's my opinion. Right there. What happens when you don't agree on what to do with your pair? What happens when you don't agree uh, what, on how to proceed with your pair? Presumably, maybe in a technical, you know, any, any, anything from programming to any kind of approach. That happens all the time. Um, so I like to, talk, to call pair programming kind of a continuous <laughs> Compromise and negotiation. Um, but I also like to say that what you often arrive at is the highest common denominator. Not the lowest, but the highest. So you take, so when you don't agree, you know, spend some time talking about it, of course. Now sometimes you won't, you know, after we'll say five, ten minutes, maybe you're both extremely passionate about these two directions. Uh, what we'll often do, and we can almost always do this, is bring in a third person who is respected by both, to say, listen, listen to this. Um, and if that's not possible, maybe you're two people, you're working on an open source project or a two person project and there's nobody to bring in. Um, sometimes you just have to go with one of them and somebody else has to just take, just kind of grin and bear it for a while and see if it, it bears fruit, see if it works out. But the other person, the person who quote unquote won, should ideally be gracious enough to say, if their idea doesn't end up working out, to say, let's try the other one. And maybe you could try both as well. Um, over here. Nonverbal communication methods that you use with pair programming. Uh, those are especially important with remote pair programming, where you often can't see each other's hands and such. Uh, but actually, I find that. Uh, a lot of people talk about, uh, will ask me, how do people, how do you decide when who's going to what we call, say, drive versus navigate or kind of sit back and not have hands on the keyboard? Because what I'm not talking about is like one person running like the left hand side of the keyboard and the other one the right. 
I did actually, as a tangent of my tangent, ask my, I, was, I, I got a haircut the other day before I came, and I asked the lady working on my hair if, if she could imagine two barbers working on the same head of hair at the same time. And she said no, because their scissors would keep hitting each other. Um, so I thought that was interesting. So I'm not talking about that. Uh, but uh, so there is like a, uh, ideally in a good pairing situation, a, a trade-off that happens, you know, as you're working. One person's typing for a little while, and then the other one takes over, and the other one takes over, and you kind of go bounce back and forth. And a lot of that, I find, is the non, it's the non-verbal communication that happens. And it's little things that you get used to picking up on. Somebody's like, uh, I'll, I'll do it on this computer here in front of me, you know, one person who's driving, they're leaning forward, they're intently typing, they're like, clearly, their eyes are focused, they're clearly like very much in a zone, and in that situation, it can be very disruptive for the other person to just jump in and grab the mouse and keyboard and start doing something, because we've all had somebody rip us out of that zone, and it's very disruptive. Now, that person is, is doing that, and then they pause, and then they do this thing, like, ah, oh, huh, now how did you, is it, is it the method on kernel? And that's when the other person can say, like, I know what that is. And they can jump, they can jump in, because they've, the person has taken themselves out of that zone, and the other person can almost always jump in without disrupting, that, without disrupting them. Um, now, you, there are little techniques we can talk about where somebody refuses to give up the keyboard, um, TDD is great for this because you can do something called ping pong pairing where one person writes a test and the other person implements and then you trade back and forth. That's like a, a, a good technique to enforce that. Um, but those little nonverbal things, you know, people taking a pause, sitting back, rubbing their face. There's always this one. This is my favorite one. This is a I'm not typing right now. Um, people do that one a lot. That's an invitation for somebody else to take over as well. Uh, it's not something over here. So then in that case, have you ever come across a situation where a remote pairing was somehow superior than regular pairing because, like, I don't know, like you had to do ping pong or, or like all these issues are gone and that's just... Mm -hmm. um, so the question was, are there situations or have people said that remote pairing can be even better than in-person pairing? It's an, that's an excellent question because I've actually uh, heard people say that they sometimes enjoy remote pairing more than in-person pairing. And I'm biased because I remote pair program full time, so I'm biased to like want people to say that. But uninvited people have said this, and the reason they've said that, or uh, and an example of why they've said that, is that when you're, say, in a busy, busy office, like the Pivotal office, we have a lot of stuff going on, and everybody is pairing, but because pairing is a lot of talking, it's there's a lot of stuff going on, and then that person like threw that Nerf ball across the room, and then you know somebody's having a birthday over here, and there's just a lot of stuff going on. Um, and remote pairing tends to focus you even more focused than you already are when you're pairing, because pairing can be extremely focusing. So when you uh, you know if you kind of put on a headset on, over your ears and you're, you're looking at a camera with this other person's face on it, and you're working on this code together, it can really laser focus you in on the problems that you're trying to solve. And so for that reason, some people have said, in some situations they prefer remote pairing because it really focuses them um, versus the kind of the distractions that can be in a quote unquote normal office. Um, uh, in, in the back, the glasses. Ah, good question. So if you are pairing with somebody who is very senior to yourself, Perhaps um, do you both do the does the pair in general get uh, benefit out of that? Uh, so I say absolutely. I think one of the core benefits of pair programming is the cross training and knowledge transfer effect of it. Now that might seem like it's all of this junior person getting all of that benefit, um, and I find that that's not the case at all. The senior person. You know, somebody's been doing this for 20 years, and they're pairing with somebody, pairing with somebody who's a, a college grad or something. That's maybe an extreme. But I can say as somebody who's been doing this for 15 years and recently was pairing with a college grad, every single day I learned something from that college grad that I didn't already know. And I actually, this is, this is no lie, I have a little notebook, a little day planner that I sit next to me on my desk, and every day I write down something that I learned from my pair. And it doesn't matter if they're senior, more senior than me, same level, 
recent college grad, I always learn something from them. So I really do think that, that that's one aspect by which a, a very diverse pair, we'll call it, or disparate pair, um, can still benefit each other. And I also find, well, let me ask you guys this question. You can think about it yourself. But I should say, I find that when I really think I know something really well, and that newbie says, what's going on here? Can you explain it? And I explain it, and they're like, I really, I still don't get it. And then I have to force myself to actually understand it better and not make all of these assumptions. And I've actually managed to talk myself out of beliefs that I've had, like actually saying them out loud, I realize, oh, that actually kind of sounds terrible. Why are we doing it that way? Have you ever had those moments? I have those moments. So that's another way in which just the, 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 the forcing the, the, the senior person to, to get into a teaching mindset can benefit them as the teacher as much as it benefits the person who's learning. Um, right here. Um, when you're pairing with people that mostly pair locally with someone next to them, um, what's been your average experience when they're done pairing remotely? They say, oh, that's much better than I thought, or it's better than local, or about the same, or? My uh, so the question was, when people who've only paired side by side in person with somebody, then does remote pairing, okay. what has been their general takeaway? And I would say almost every single time, They've said that it was almost exactly like in-person pairing. Not necessarily better. I mean, I say, I bet if you were to like put it on a 100-point scale, they'd probably rank it lower than in-person pairing. And I would never go so far as to say, like, all right, everybody go home and buy a headset and some high-speed internet, and you should just stay home. Because uh, I, if I had a choice, I would be side-by-side -side pairing with the people that I work with. Because you get so much higher fidelity of everything. But back to your question, people almost universally say that it was way better than they expected, because it is intimidating. It's like, well, there's technology going on and like some kind of blurry video, and you know, it's like, what's going to happen? I've never done this before, and like, ah, the, the screen is typing on its own. And um, the novelty of the remote situation, I'd say it falls away very quickly, like probably within an hour or less. And because once you get into that zone of like, oh, okay, well, should we extract an object here or, or not? And then you, you just revert right back into the normal conversations you have all the time while pairing. And whether or not that person's, the conversation you're having is with a remote person or not, it's the same conversation. And it's the same ebb and flow of the pairing experience, uh, as long as you, you know, have a good high-speed internet, internet and things like that. Um, so people usually say that it's really good. Uh, right there, maybe. Do I ever want to just work by myself? And the answer is yes. Yes, I do. Hi, my name's Joe. I've pair programmed pretty much my entire career. And I still really sometimes miss working by myself. Um, uh, it is a different experience. Uh, you know what? I'm going to unplug this. Everybody got this slide? Does anybody have any questions about the words? <laughs> They're on here. All right. Um, uh, so yes, I do miss working by myself sometimes. And there are times, like the way our company is structured, sometimes you're in between client engagements and you might have a few days where it just makes more sense for you to work from, uh, work by yourself. Or I've had people ask me, uh, so if you're, uh, if you exclusively pair a program and your pair is sick, do you just take the day off too? It's like, well, no, we're not, in, we're not like that dogmatic, you know? <laughs> We're not going to send people home because somebody has a, you know, because their pair has a cold or something like that. Uh, and those days are, I'm not going to lie, it's really fun. And I can also honestly say that I check in some of my worst code during those days and make dumb mistakes and thrash on these easy things that my pair would have just been like, what are you doing? Like, it's, you're, you're making a mistake right here. So it's fun, but it's sort of a, like when my wife is, go, is out of town for a few days. It's kind of like, bachelor time! Stay up late and uh, you know, drink that one extra beer and things like that. But you know, in the end, it's better to go back to a more disciplined state. Uh, right here, blue shirt. So the question was, uh, what if you have a pairing situation where people are almost of the same mind? 
you know, they agree on everything, they're at the same experience level, there's very little interchange of ideas or knowledge because they're basically on the same page. Um, I found that that's an extremely rare situation because we're all extremely opinionated people and we have uh, probably even more, like maybe, now maybe it wasn't as fair as it is to say, people didn't have different experiences from their past. Different projects, different companies. It may be different if two people are, say, hired on the same day, straight out of college or something like that, and kind of come up together, only working together on the same projects. You know, that may be a situation where it might be more likely for them to have kind of this groupthink, you know, total lock-in of ideas, because they've had such a narrow band of experience. But in my experience, that's even people who are of the same age and graduated college at the same time and worked at, say, similar companies before working together, all that other experiences have come, built them into different people with different ideas and, and have a lot to contribute to each other. So I can imagine that situation happening, but I would imagine it also being extremely rare. Uh, and there almost always being an inter interchange of ideas uh, between almost any pairing combination, in my experience. Uh, Gray shirt. Have you ever been paired with someone who uses a different editor than you? I've ever. <laughs> oh boy. The editor. What editor do you use? What key mappings do you use? God damn, Dvorak. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, the answer is yes, all the time. Um, even amongst, you know, Pivotal is kind of famous for being dogmatic about things like key mapping and everybody using the same editor. But guess what? Different offices use different editors um, and key mappings and such. Uh, so uh, it, that could definitely be hard. I can imagine that being a, a bigger issue in, say, an open source situation. Hey, do you want to work on some open source? Okay, that's great. Okay, now we're kind of, we, everybody has their custom tuned laptop just for them. Um, if somebody really wants to learn that other editor, that's, that's a great opportunity to do so. Oh, you're an Emacs person, I'm a Vim person, you know, this is a great opportunity for me to learn Emacs or, or opposite. Or opposite. Um, at the very least, finding the default settings on those editors, like, so you don't overwrite all of the defaults, go like reverting back to the defaults on a lot of these editors can help because the other person, they may not know your custom thing, but they know the defaults of whatever that editor are whatever that editor is. Um, so like finding some compromise uh, can be great. It's also a good opportunity for you both to use something you're not familiar with and you can both learn that together. Uh, let's do this side, uh, right here. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> So I think the question is, like, how do you decide kind of how much driving one person does versus somebody else? You know, like, do you, do you switch off the, the typing every few minutes or every few hours or maybe somebody all, types all day long and then it's the other person's turn the next day? Um, I would say, um, this is going to sound a little squishy, but kind of whatever works out great for the pair within, within limits. So, for example, I would probably never say, except in weird situations, like somebody has, like I used to work with somebody who had RSI, literally could not type. Yes, pair programming with somebody who is physically incapable, incapable of typing. Um, so, except in those situations, I would say, like, going all day without having somebody pair is pretty unbalanced. Um, down to the other extreme of, like, you trade letters. <laughs> Too far. Um, I find that, you know, uh, basically you know, every kind of few minutes, I find like there can be, um, you can use things like ping pong pairing to enforce a flow in a situation that would go unbalanced without it. Like that person is just a keyboard hog and they're just not going to give up the keyboard because they, oh my god, the typing is so much fun. Um, and then the other pair can say like, hey, what do you, that's, that's also kind of a little non-confrontational cue. It's like, hey, maybe we should ping pong this one and that, oh, uh, okay, I, I get it. I'm going to sit on my hands now. Um, so that can be a good way of bringing the flow back. But like, like there was a, there was a, a question earlier about nonverbal communication, and, and I kind of turned it into how the flow works out. And just those little people, 
people go through little peaks and valleys, big ones throughout the day. Like maybe you had breakfast and you're like, and your coffee and you're up here. And then it's like, you know, 15 minutes before lunch and you're kind of like, you know, struggling. And then of course there's that two, there's that like three o'clock where like the burrito you ate is like really, really working on you pretty hard. And you're like feeling like you're going to fall asleep. But you're inevitably people's rhythms are off. They're not going to be locked directly in as, as, as far as like their energy level. So I, kinda, I call it like riding the peaks. So somebody's like really into it and then they kind of take a little pause and they're thinking and that's a great opportunity and a good healthy pairing scenario where the other person can kind of jump in. And my, in my experience that's every, tends to be every few minutes, sometimes five, sometimes ten, sometimes two. Hope that answers your question. Uh, the other guy who didn't get to talk earlier. Okay, a couple, couple questions there. Um, one, uh, in an in effort to sort of balance the pairs so you don't have too many kind of um, either experience levels that are exactly the same or totally wide ranging ones. Do you ever, do we ever say, try to mix up the pairs specifically to pair people together um, purposefully like? Uh, so the short answer is yes, we sometimes will do that. Especially when it's something like, uh, hey John, is really good at CSS. We have this CSS chore coming up. Uh, and hey, you know, Sally, you really don't know any CSS. This is you, but you've said you want to learn. How about if you guys pair up so somebody can learn? Um, or when somebody has been working on, say, this one area of the code a lot, and it's kind of become theirs, which is a kind of a danger. Um, then getting, rotating people through that e expert rapidly. Uh, so that they can transfer, get that, get that knowledge shared amongst the rest of the team. We'll do that on purpose as well. Uh, the second part of your question was, well, how do you decide when people are going to pair? Um, and a uh, couple answers to that. One, we, as part of our morning kind of stand-up meeting, morning meeting, uh, check-in, we say, who wants to switch pairs? We try to switch every day if we can. Uh, we tend to structure our projects such that the thing you're working on are these little bits that you can often get done in a day. So that's a great opportunity to change. It's like, hey, we just finished that thing on the profile page. I'm done, or we're done with that. Let's mix it up. Who finished something yesterday? Okay, let's trade. Uh, sometimes you'll have people who need to stick together for a few days, and that's just time. Um, now, and, but the opposite can happen where maybe there's this really long running feature, super complex, these two people, they've been working together for three days on it. Maybe they've like managed to convince people to let them go four days on it. At, and they're still together and still not done. We usually will encourage them to break up and get another mind in there because that usually means they're stuck on something or that the stuff they're working on is so complex that we need to get some other ideas and mind there. So those are all ways in which we decide how to combine pairs. Right, cross-training different disciplines like sysops and programming. Um, I might turn that into uh, bringing pairing with designers, uh, pairing with your product manager. Um, I I love that um, for many reasons. One, there is the the easy win of like cross cross training. Somebody who's not very good at sysops or pairing with a sysops person, they're both going to learn a lot from each other. Uh, but then there's also, I feel like, the secondary benefit of, there, there can also be these camps. Uh, those, uh, you know, those ops guys, you know what they're like. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, all those designers, boy, Photoshop, what's that? Um, it, so pairing can also bring together these different people and, hey, turns out we're all pretty much the same. We're all kind of geeky people and we like to learn from each other and so pairing can break down those kind of social barriers as well. So there's literally, yes, cross-training. Now something I haven't necessarily seen is full-time pairing between these different organizations. Like you always have a programmer always paired with a sysops person. Um, those tend to be more targeted things, like you're both 
you got to deploy to that server, and IT kind of owns that. But hey, let's work together on getting this working because IT's never deployed that thing you're trying to deploy. Those are, those are great targeted situations to, to pair. I think we have time for maybe one more way in the back. When should you not pair? Oh my gosh, 45 seconds. Um, that's, 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 a tough, that's a tough question. I don't think there's any one situation, like, you know, definitely in the pair programming handbook on line, you know, 50, it says don't pair in this situation. Um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll change your question into, like, uh, make sure that you take breaks. If you are getting burned out on pairing, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to say, like, can I just solo today? Um, now, are there tasks that shouldn't be paired on? I don't necessarily think so. I think, you know, you may find something. But um, I would say make sure that you, you take breaks throughout the day so that you can kind of take a break from this intense situation. And then once in a, once in a while, you may not want to, you might want to take a break from pairing altogether just to sort of take a break from that ultra intense interaction. You may need a break. And I think that that's okay. And I think that that's time. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Thank you.